Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. We are covering chapters 13 through 19 of Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros today. But before we begin this deep dive, please listen closely to our content warning. Most importantly, spoilers for all of Iron Flame. We may be focusing on chapters 13 through 19 today, but we are bringing the whole book into the conversation. That is everything from Iron Flame, Fourth Wing, and anything else that Rebecca Yaros has said it's all on the table. So if you don't know why Nasia should be fired from his job, then please pause, go listen to slash read the book, and then come back and listen to this podcast. We will be here when you're done. Next up, this podcast is Rated R. We of Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things using adult words about an adult book. Violet might be with boring sexless books, but we aren't because we have Iron Flame. So please be mindful of small listening ears. And the last thing before we jump into our Iron Flame episode three. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream our livelihood, if you want more content, more community, connection, discounts on merch, early access to episodes, and more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, Cadet and Dragon Riders, and our Patreon community is Oh, so freaking incredible. We just did our first monthly live a few weeks ago, and we're actually doing our next monthly live this upcoming Saturday, and we cannot wait to see our Patreon members there. The link to become a member of our Patreon is in the show notes or YouTube captions, depending on how you're listening. And really and truly, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for bringing these episodes to you. And now, it's time to fail our land navigation badge with RSC. Let's begin this episode deep dive with Battle Brief, aka Nicole's summary of what what happens in chapters 13 through 19 of Iron Flame? Chapter 13. Arriving back from Samara, Violet is immediately told to join Carr and Varish. And boy, oh boy, is it a homecoming. Varish forces Violet to wield as many lightning strikes as possible, not only to the point where she's beyond overheating, and this time it's not from Taryn asking, shall he get the wing leader, but because she is on the brink of burnout. After strike 41, ending with Violet locking up and quite literally almost dying, Varish lets her go. Thank Thanks, my guy. Nurse Taryn takes Violet to the icy river to dunk Violet in the world's worst polar plunge. Violet is met with a blanket, Bodhi, Imogen, and Aya who assist in getting Violet back to her normal body temp and back to Beskyeth. Later that week, our squad is back at sparring and Sloane is getting her ass handed to her again. Imogen and Violet watch this painful match, but then there's a tap on Violet's shoulder, spinning around and ready to strike her attacker. She realizes, oh, I have Riddick at knife point. But all he wanted was to see if she wanted to walk to physics class together. On their walk, a anxiety-filled Violet is frantically looking around in every crevice for a potential assassin's. But right then, a bag is thrown over her head and she is immediately unconscious. Dun, 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 chapter 14. Time to go camping! After waking up in the middle of a forest with a squad from second wing, two infantry squads, two heel and a scribe, Professor Grady gives them their assignment. Only after giving them water, which is of course poisoned, which cuts them off from their dragons. I'm shaking my head at you guys. Their objective is to use the map to get to the designated point. Oh, we're working together as a team. Oh, and just one other thing. Dragons are hunting you. Simple enough, right? Nope, this is a shit show. Not only are there way too many egos in this forest, like Riddick feeling superior to Cadet Asshole, the infantry squad leader, and they're bickering enough to not realize until hours in that there are two maps and yes, they are different. They run into Bay to jag fucking Barlow's dragon and being the unpredictable orange that she is, she tries to torch a cadet as she runs away, but Tomas from Second Wing is the victim here. And that is why you should fucking listen to Rihanna in chapter 15. It's the next day and our land nav crew is still wandering out in the woods. As they're settling in for the night, Violet goes to relieve Riddick of watch and is brought dinner by a very thankful Dyer who Violet saved while facing off with Bade and a very skeptical Rihanna. Rihanna orders Violet to go to Sleep, but not before giving her the best friend slap in the face of a lifetime. She knows something's up, and when Violet is ready to talk, she'll be there, but no more insulting their friendship by lying. Ouch, but honestly, fair. The next day, the failure carriage comes to pick up the infantry along with some very, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed teachers. But the dragons also arrive to pick up our squad from school. Violet immediately confirms to Taryn that he got to see Sigale and worries about the likelihood about her getting to see her man next week.
week, chapter 16. Later that day, a Zaydenless Violet decides to use her time wisely and visit the archives. She runs into Jacinia, and these two have a totally surface level, not at all treason, and could be considered murdered for this conversation. Jacinia, this brilliant fucking woman, figures out why Violet has been lying and asking for specific books. And the two come up with a deal. On Saturdays, Violet comes to the archives for books on building the wards. And only on Saturdays will Jacinia give her the earliest version of the book that they have. And by the way, did I mention that only on Saturdays they can do this? Because literally or else they'll die if they get caught. But Jacinia wants something in return. The next day, it's sparring challenge time. And shock of shock, Sloane still sucks. After Violet drugs Sloane's opponent and Sloane surprisingly wins the match, Violet gives this little fucking spoiled brat a deal. Train with Imogen and every week you'll get one of Liam's letters. Sloane is shocked, but unsurprisingly a bitch about it. But as Imogen and Violet walk away, Imogen tells Violet that she finally sees why Zayden fell for this brilliant fucking woman. As Violet is ready to head to Taren to fly to Samara, she is met by Varish again, who checks her pack and insists on walking her out. And just when you thought this guy couldn't suck anymore, he made for sure that Zayden was on 24-hour duty when Violet visited. Fuck you! Chapter 17. Who needs Dr. Phil when you have Imogen? Imogen and Violet are heading to Battle Brief and Imogen serves up some cold hard truths. One, Zayden will always have secrets. Get the fuck over it. Two, talk to your fucking friends. Just before Battle Brief, Reese shows Violet a highly ominous letter from her family, which Markham plucks out of her hand. And then he proceeds to spew lies for the whole class period. An absolutely panicked Violet runs to the archives and begs Jacinia, who is definitely in class, for another book. Jacinia is like, bitch, I said Saturdays. And maybe you should talk to your friends. Violet, have you gotten the hint? Talk to your friends. Chapter 18, Zaddy's back. And homeboy looks exhausted. After getting washed up, he comes to a sexless book, Violet, and quickly figures out that Violet has been doing her super secret, super dangerous wards project. And he is pissed. After arguing wordlessly in front of all of her squad mates that will never not make me laugh, Zayden follows Violet to the archives and they argue the whole way there. Well, at least until they run into a ragged Nolan who waits for Caroline Ashton. They finally make it to the archives and Jacinia where they do another book exchange and Zayden doesn't murder her on the spot so at least he deemed her worthy. On their way back to the writer's quadrant they take their argument to such a heated level that Zayden storms off and Violet wakes up with his things being gone. <laughs> Chapter 19. At flight maneuvers a very nervous Violet spots a smiling Varish and Darna is again not here and Varish is looking like it's fucking Christmas morning just as he's about to base skip up to the mountaintop and watch Violet burn out. Daddy Taren is like, Varish, hold my beer! Taren sinks his teeth into Solus's neck and demands Varish to apologize on his knees. Not normally the reason people get on their knees on this podcast. And his groveling is glorious. But Solus is looking like he's about to enter his reputation era. Later on that week, Violet is ready to head off to Samara and her good friend Ree is walking her out to the flight field. And Finally, after some frustration from Ree, Violet explodes with every ounce of emotion that she's been holding into her little box, and it's heartbreaking. And just as Violet is about to tell her best friend basically everything, Varish comes to break up this party. He does his normal check with his normal douche canoe-ness, and once he leaves, Ree thanks her friend for opening up to her. But Violet finally tells her friend one truth that she can give her. Nothing is all right. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my goodness. As always, thank you so much for that battle brief, Nicole. Now let's don our signet powers where we are going to look at key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and of course, all of our favorites, the theories. I have a quick note just right off the top of chapter 13. Taryn says, quote, I'm always holding back secret dragon knowledge, but wards are not amongst it. This really stood out to me because I was like, oh, the dragons don't even know how to raise the wards. Maybe the elders do because they seem to be like, ooh, we know everything. Or is it just the journals that hold this info, which seems wild to me. I I agree that it does seem wild, but I do think that's the case. I mean, like the elders, because they're not old enough to have been part of this 600 years ago. Even the elders are what, like, Taryn is middle age and he's about 100. So we can guess that the elders are a little bit closer to 200 years. So they are still nowhere close to 600, 650 years old. So it either would have been passed down among these elders, which I don't feel like it is. It has been. I guess not, but I feel like it should have been. A lot of things should have happened. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> Touche. That that stood out to me as well. That it's like, wow, like this really and truly is such a big secret. Now, of course, the dragons could these elders could be keeping this secret from their humans. That is certainly not a far stretch whatsoever. I really do think that it is in these journals because even in these journals, it's not even truthful. Like, like one of the journals is outright not telling the full truth so that you can't raise the wards again. I think that it is a secret that is that well protected. Okay, now we have to talk about this crazy signet punishment chapter. I'll just kick it off here by saying, wow, Professor Carr, you really let us down and you suck. <laughs> Like, in the lead up to Iron Flame, if you haven't been following along on this podcast, we really thought that Professor Carr was undercover for the revolution, but oh, how wrong we were. Professor Carr is complacent, first and foremost. He only thinks of each person as their signet and what their signet power is. And worst of all, he went about Violet's training all wrong. Just all wrong. The irony that his dragon's name is Brugan, which means in Scottish Gaelic, lies, is hilarious. Like, all of my love for Professor Carr was built on lies. <laughs> oh, man. Another chapter we can close is our love for Professor Carr. Without getting too far ahead of ourselves, once when Violet has a real lightning-wielding lesson with Felix, it's like, wow, how did we not see it? Which, of course, is the point here, because Violet didn't see it either. In the here and now, where we are in this chapter 13, Carr's method is the only one we and Violet know of. So we along with Violet, think that she just has bad aim, that this is about her skill, when really she's trying to go down double black diamonds when she needs to start on the bunny slope. Like, it is not your fault that you were taught all wrong by. Tell me you're from Colorado without <laughs> telling me you're from Colorado. <laughs> But hey, Professor Carr's got nothing on Varish, who is hell-bent on punishing Violet. I will say there's one moment when it says, quote, when I don't move, Carr sends me a pleading look, his eyes darting to Varish. Did Varish threaten Carr in some way? Or does Carr just not want to see her locked away? Because this line and others in this stretch do show that he has some mercy and I'm that that's in like italics air quotes <laughs> you know highlighted kinda but because at the again at the end of her training session Carr looks at her with a lot of sympathy he tells her to go get food and a cold bath and then of course he's like you're a rare signet and it's like you're so close Carr you were so close my guy yes I think that it is because he looks at her as a very valuable signet and he sees what Varish is doing is wrong for plenty of reasons and his main concern is Violet burning out. And then we, they lose her signet power. And that is his big concern. I will also say that as much hate as I was literally just giving Professor Carr, I would still put him in the neutral professor camp among all of our characters here. Varish and Colonel Atos, even though he's not a professor, either of them are professors, but they are absolutely in the bad guy camp. Markham professor Markham, exactly. Yeah. Markham is another one in that bad guy camp. The good professors is like Devera. But I really do think that Professor Carr is neutral. He is there just to show up and teach. And I don't know if he's part of the big elaborate lies and all of that. He's there to teach the students and that's what he's there for. That's also what I think about Professor Grady. I know we have differing opinions on that, but I put him and Grady in that neutral professor category. I think that's fair. I think about like Professor Kaori. You know, when Violet's facing off with Varish, she has the dagger like in her, in Zayden's flight jacket. This is in the later 20s chapter, so we'll get to this in a few episodes, but you know, Kaori comes up and he's like, oh, well, I had a little chat with Pancheck and da-da-da-da-da, and like defends her. And when you see that in comparison to this scene with Carr, where he's just like, keep wielding, keep wielding, keep wielding. <laughs> like, you, you can do this. Just, it'll be over soon enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do love the moment when Taryn like roars so loudly that it, that Carr's book just tumbles <laughs> down the mountain. I love that moment. It, it's moments like this that I just can't wait for the TV series. I'm so excited to see these fun little moments just play out on screen. You know, I know we've said this, I think, in every single episode, but Varish really does remind me of Umbridge. The way he smiles at her, like he's simply exchanging pleasantries as he knowingly pushes her towards burnout. I just like, I can't stop thinking about that parallel there. And I just, I have to say it at every opportunity. <laughs> It's such an obvious parallel, like whether or not Umbridge was any inspiration to Rebecca Yaros as she was creating Varish, like anyone who's read Harry Potter or seen the movies even can't help but immediately go to that comparison. I'm going to go back immediately on the words that I said in, I think it was episode one, where I was like, I don't know who's worse. Varish is worse. Varish is absolutely worse. I'm going to fully put that myself in that camp now that we started the deep dive. Are you? I'm nervous? not ready. I'm not ready to have this conversation right now because I want to keep moving along. But I don't think people remember how bad 
Umbridge is or like what she did to all the Muggleborns too. Mm-hmm. And I, we also just get her for so much longer. I think that if we had Varish in more than half of a book, then absolutely we would see his real evilness play out in bigger ways. I'm a little bit sad that he died so quickly, but – I'm sure that there's a good reason behind that. (laughs) Taryn lunged for Carr and Varys' dragons at strike 13. And my initial reaction here is, why didn't Taryn stop this earlier? My best understanding is he has his rules to follow. He's bound by the Empyrean. And Violet has her rules to follow bound by Besgaia than her writer's quadrant. It's a balancing act of needing to let the humans live within their system And, you know, making sure his writer doesn't die. And, you know, Violet reflects this really well, is that there's only so much that Taryn can do. I think that Taryn also really respects Violet for what she's doing here. He knows that she's doing this for Andarna's sake, and he knows that Violet is worthy to keep the secret. Now, he thankfully does eventually stop this when Violet very well may die if she does another one. And he's almost right because she does push herself through that last one and she does almost die. So I'm glad that he did, you know, make it stop for the most part at the end there. Varish's character. Ah, he is so frequently described as in control. Violet notes, quote, if he's the picture of control, then maybe I should be glad I don't seem to have any. We know that Venom cannot be cured, only controlled. Is all of this picture of control language and happens in a lot of other instances too, hinting that he actually is a venom being controlled like by Atos? Or is it simply part of him being an evil asshole? Which is, again, going back to the umbrage you know, she was always kind of like the picture of control sort of thing too. And anyway, I just, I had to pull that control language out. Oh, I love that. I'm like, the more and more I'm in into this deep dive, the more and more I'm like, I think Varish is Venon. I really do. Now, Varish and Solus's bond. Taryn says that Solus is an example of making poor human bond choices. He said something similar about Glean and Bade last year too, that they should not be giving certain assholes more power. Is this a Venon clue, do you think? Now, that would also mean Caroline Ashton, which we'll get to her more later in this episode. Is this a Venom clue, do you think? I don't know if it's so much a Venom clue, but it's, again, just drawing some really clear parallels between these, I'll call them bad characters, and these unpredictable orange dragons. And I just am keeping a close eye on it. (laughs) I hate this. I hate it. I love it. I actually do love it. This is the shit I find delicious. When Varish mentions that he doesn't want to submit Andarna for tests or anything barbaric, I can't help but recall Colonel Atos saying last year that he wanted to do research on Andarna. And for how close these two bad guys are, I wonder if this is a bold-faced lie that Varish is saying. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of that barbaric line, Taryn says, and this is in his mind to mind speak with Violet, quote, Solus should never have given this barbarian more power. The next line, Varish says, quote, I don't want to submit her for tests or anything barbaric. That is such a specific word barbaric, barbarian. That's not really a word that is just like commonly used in the day-to-day language because I actually think those are the only two times this is used in the book. And then quote, this is Violet's inner monologue, as though he heard Taryn's words. What do you make of this? I did not think of that. And we're even talking about this in more detail later in this episode. So maybe let's hold off. But I just wanted to bring that up here. That- we'll close this out later. My one thing I'll say here now is if Varish is Venon, do Venon have some kind of intrinsic abilities? Is that why they want Zayden so badly? <laughs> Sorry, you're on the intrinsic train again. <laughs> I always will be on the intrinsic train. I will never <laughs> leave the intrinsic train. I know to stay on the intrinsic train now. I learned my lesson. <laughs> I just thought that was so interesting and especially the quote as though he heard Taryn's words we heard this regularly with Violet in fourth wing quote I didn't realize I said that out loud or you know stuff like that around Zayden and this just felt like a very similar type of sentence it was interesting It is very interesting. Hmm. We'll talk more about this later. I want to give a reminder here about why it's such a big deal for Andarna to be seen. Feathertail is also known as dragon kids, dragon babies, have powers that they can transfer directly to their human. Like Andarna could freeze time last year, and therefore Violet could also freeze time through Andarna. This is different than channeling power. Every dragon channels power into their bonded human via the relic, which then manifests into a signet based on the unique chemistry of the person at their core, plus channel dragon power. 
Technically, last year, Violet did have two powers. One was lightning, which was her manifested signet from Taryn, of course, and the other was freezing time, which was directly given to her and powered by Andarna, hence why Andarna was so tired afterward and it had consequences. Now, imagine if greedy humans, people like Varish, know that feather tails are, number one, able and willing to bond in addition to another dragon. Two, have unique powers that can be directly transferred to the human so that the human can have more power. And if Andarna was out of this dreamless sleep, which she definitely shouldn't be, and showed herself, it would be obvious she grew and everyone can put two and two together. Feather tails are extremely rare because they're baby dragons. Baby dragons can bond as second dragons. And somehow, some way, soon enough, people would also discover the unique power and the ability to take and use it. I don't know exactly how they would figure that out, especially with Andarna and Violet's powers, but the secret would eventually unravel. Part of protecting hatchlings is protecting the secret. And Andarna was able to bond with Violet last year because she has no elders of her den to stop her. And one of the reasons she trusted Violet to bond her is because she knows Violet will endure whatever she has to in order to protect Andarna's secret. Ooh, I- also, not to mention the prophecy and, you know, Violet being the scribe with the heart of a writer and all that kind of stuff that Andarna was like, mm, my ear perked up. I'm going to bond her. Yes, exactly. I just wanted to share that so we're all on the same footing that this is why it is so important that Indarna does stay hidden. Now, when Professor Carr says that Violet is a signet weapon generals dream of in this war, I have to ask this apparently reoccurring question of mine. Which war is he referring to? Carr's obviously not with the revolution, but he comes off like he might know and not care. I don't think he's super tied up in the crazy secrets, you know, like Professor Markham is, for instance. But I could see him kind of knowing and just not really caring. So I'm going to guess that the war he's referring to is against the Griffins. He's more concerned about these attacks and it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind with the Venom. But then again, lightning can kill Venom and Wyvern. We don't know how many people are aware of that. It's hinted in the fables, but obviously not many people have read that forbidden book. If Carr is familiar with all of this, he may know that there is a bigger war on the horizon, and that is why Violet's lightning wielding is so central to this bigger war. I did not think about this, and it does make me have slightly more respect for Carr. Emphasis on the word slightly, though. But it does make me think about the epigraph. I can't remember which one it is, but when Melgren's signet manifested how it changed wars forever so I do kind of think that's more where Carr is coming from because that like it changed wars forever I'm firmly in the like that was the Navarre war that they were thinking about I do think it was Carr thinking in the Navarre war side versus Griffins and poor Emil and all that kind of stuff but I like to think that maybe he knows about the venom and he's like but here's the deal if he knew about the venom he would not be training her to just strike strike he'd be training her to aim well in his own way he's kind of He's got a. Kinda. I don't get me back on my high horse with his training methods. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cover that when we get to feel like right. I cannot wait. I for can't it. either. Yeah, I do agree though that I think that he is in general talking about the war with poor Emil because we will see later on in this book his prejudice against them. So I do think that's the war he is talking about. But always have to ask. <laughs> always, Violet almost burns out, and she goes into this healing state. I'll call it for lack of a better term. And this scene is horrific absolutely horrific and yet it's sh- it's such an important one because it shows you how much the marked ones take care of each other we learn imogen's dragon's name glan which in scottish gaelic and irish both mean clean which is interesting i was like clean that's not a word i would usually go with imogen but i was like is it like clean out your memories like a nice spring cleaning of your memories i don't know that's the only thing i could think of we also learn bodie's dragon's name which is queer a green dragon and in scottish gaelic and irish It means add, which is also interesting considering his signet literally subtracts other (laughs) signets. So it's like, add, what is add here? But I just thought those were two things that I'm always going to call out dragon names. You know me. As Violet is coming back up to normal body temp, though, she sees a tree, quote, which I know bears the scar from two knife marks. This is such a nice callback to the night of the Marked Ones meeting and Zayden giving them the like, here's how to stay alive advice last year. This also primes us for later in the book when Zayden is admitting he's an intrinsic. He calls back to this moment because this is one of the first moments he used his intrinsic power on her. But this is also just such a human moment because right after that, it's followed by 
I want Zayden. And it's not his protection. It's not his like whatever. It's she just wants him. And it's so sad. It just makes me so sad and melts. And it's just like that's such a human thing in this moment of just sheer turmoil to want the person who makes you feel the most comfortable, the most at home. It's almost like, I mean, we've compared this to like, you know, when you leave and then you come back and you hug mom and dad and you just burst into tears because reasons. It's kind of that similar thing, except he's not her parent. <laughs> Maybe I should have used one of our husbands as an example. No, I mean, like, like, for instance, like my, I've been in several long distance relationships, including with my husband. We were apart for six months. It's hard. It is so yeah. hard. I think a lot of us can relate to this long distance feelings that, that they really do have very frequently throughout this, at least for half of the book. Oh, yeah. Taryn says that he is going to handle dragon matters. What do you think he did? Well, Sola still has his other eye, so we obviously <laughs> didn't do anything too crazy. No, so, so I was wondering the same thing because on the one hand, I feel like he would be extremely angry specifically at these two dragons for punishing her with her signet in this way. Like that is something that they should not be doing. Varish and Carr were really playing with fire <laughs> <laughs> with her potentially burning out. Like Carr was like, you are about to kill her. And Varish is like, I don't give a fuck. I think that maybe Taryn is like, okay, we need to draw some barriers here. But I don't see him being that reasonable. I Again, I'm really surprised that he did not specifically go after Solas in the veil. Ooh, like behind the scenes dragon murder? Yeah. Well, or not even just murder, but just like giving him a snap, smack on the knuckles kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, because that sounds like Taryn. Actually, that kind of does. That does sound like Taryn. Yeah, I am kind of surprised too. I, I do wonder, did he go to the Elder Orange Dragon where he like went to teach her and was basically like, Solace is doing this, <laughs> <laughs> like tattletailed, which honestly, like considering how the Empyrean, what we know about how the Empyrean works, I could see that happening. I don't know. That just stood out to me. And I was like, hmm, Taryn's doing some behind the scenes. Well, well, and then I'll say this too. Whatever he did didn't do anything because- I know, but orange dragons are unpredictable. Yeah. So maybe- Maybe, maybe the head of that den is just useless. <laughs> Probably. <That's funny. laughs> now we got to talk about Sloan and her terrible sparring session. But before, I have to talk about my new obsession, which honestly might be up here with my intrinsic obsession, and I'm so here for this. So as Sloan is fighting, she looks down, which mistake number one, but her opponent lands, quote, a jaw-cracking punch that sends Sloan sprawling. Huh. This sounds like it had a little extra oomph behind that hit. And then it says, quote, I get that Jacek's channeling some extra anger, but I've never seen him hit that hard. Ree then chastises Tomas, Jacek's squad leader, and guess what wing they're in, Lexi? Guess. Take a guess. Oh, they're in second wing. <laughs> they're in second wing. So last episode, we speculated that something fishy might be happening to the folks in second wing. Bodhi's assassin was in second wing. Violet's assassin, who was also a Venon is in second wing. There's multiple mentions of second wing and I love this one here because it's saying how there's extra anger or there's extra oomph behind that hit. Now I went on a theory that was by Nicole on TikTok that speculated second wing is a testing ground for venification by leadership and I'm so here for this theory. It's actually wild. And now Jacek is taking things too far on the mat and he is also in second wing. Another word also they say channeling. He's channeling some serious anger. That seems like a very specific word that they're using here. He is also the younger brother of the guy who was hauled away last episode for asking about a fight in his village that left his parents and family dead. And he was then killed for that. So maybe Jacek going Venon was part of his punishment. Now he could also just be pissed that his brother is dead and he's like, you know, channeling some extra anger. But I don't know, something fishy's happening in Second Wing. I'm so convinced. I definitely thought it was just he's pissed off about his brother being killed. That was my understanding. But I love this Second Wing thing. Now, a lot of people have also pointed out too that Dane was originally in second wing and his squad with Violet got moved into fourth wing. So <gasps> Violet was originally supposed to be in second wing where Dane was his first year, I assume. The chills that just <laughs> shot up my body. I love this shit. This is my favorite. <laughs> oh my God. So, you know, Ark shows a little bit of privileged ignorance here when he says that he thought everyone marked was trained to fight. Remember, he secretly supports the rebellion's cause even though he He's not actively involved with anyone tied to the current revolution yet. He probably felt a little bit better about the marked ones being required to go into the writer's quadrant be 
because he was under the impression they were being trained to survive in it at their foster homes. Training for the Riders Quadrant is super common practice as kids anticipate volunteering for this elite military path. And the oldest marked ones like Zayden and crew were training while they were fostered. But it's also assumed that Navarian leadership didn't expect dragons to bond with the marked ones, and especially that they would rise in the ranks like Zayden, Garrick, and Bodhi have. So it was a huge surprise to everyone when these older marked ones started doing really well in the Riders Quadrant. And that's when the fostering noble families started stifling the younger ones' opportunities to survive, hence bond with the dragon in the Riders Quadrant. This is so apparent in Sloan. She's had no training where she was fostered, even though it was known she would have to fight for survival in the Riders Quadrant. But hey, her lack of training does not damper her spirits or her stubbornness. No, it does not. <laughs> no, it does not. Imogen is the best. Like, I tell you what, I need her and Rhi as my two best friends. They balance each other out with Imogen's brass tacks and Rhi's supportive problem solving. Like, these are my two that I need here. Imogen really just hits the nail on the head. Quote, I, unlike some people, don't feel the need to know everything someone else deems private. Side note, I am happily married to a man, but dang, I would find out <laughs> if I'm Imogen's type so I can see how phenomenal she actually is a bit. As the bisexual sister of the two of us, I will say that I put Imogen on my short list of passes that I have with my husband. Yes, I know she's fake. I don't care. And I asked him before I put this on my mental list and he was like, I would too. <laughs> like he, he, he was like, I understand. I'm probably a little too Hufflepuff for her, but you know. <laughs> she would tear you apart in bed. <laughs> Hold on, I can think I can hold my own, but that's a different subject. I wouldn't know that information and I don't want to. <laughs> Moving on. We talked about this last episode and we have to bring it up again. Sloane is kind of surprisingly not a likable character, and readers have felt a lot of confusion around her. For instance, why won't Sloan accept help from Imogen, a fellow marked one who she obviously knows well enough for Imogen to send her letters last year? Imogen, to answer this question, says she has no fucking clue. But I'm going to take a stab and analyze Sloan's character mindset here, because I think we as readers kind of need it. Sloan is a 20-year-old who was separated from her beloved brother right after their parents were executed when she was only 14 years old. Now, in his foster home, Liam had brotherly support in Zayden, he was trained to succeed in the writer's quadrant. Sloane, on the other hand, we can assume was alone without similar support. She was not trained, which shows she was probably fostered by a very loyal, noble family that didn't give two shits if she lived. In fact, it's not a stretch at all to assume they preferred she would die. That's a tough six years in the prime of your adolescence. In that time, she didn't have anyone to lean on, we can assume. She's made it this far in her life on her own by sheer will and stubbornness to prove the loyal Navarians wrong by simply surviving. Now, now, Sloane is in the writer's quadrant. She isn't reunited with her brother like she hoped for six years leading up to her conscription day. And that just fuels her anger even more at the establishment. They took her brother away from her when she was finally not going to be alone anymore. And who's an easy target to place all of her blame? Violet. It hurts our hearts, but it all makes so much sense. And I love the complicated dynamic of their relationship. This feels so realistic, especially for 20 year olds navigating trauma, loss, and survival. She's probably mad at herself for getting her hopes up that she wouldn't be so alone anymore. But Liam's death solidifies in her mind that she can't rely on anyone but herself. There is no hope to place in other people, including the brother she loved so much. And this all contributes to her tough, stubborn exterior. Yes, even to Imogen. Are you crying, Nicole? I almost was. <laughs> that was so well done. I think it's so important for us to analyze these characters in this way, like reminding ourselves how old they are, reminding ourselves what their past is. You know, it's so easy to read a character on the page and be like, oh, well, they're annoying. Oh, well, they're not thinking clearly, da, 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 da. But we have to go into their mindset and what their current circumstances are and their past ones. So I thought that was beautiful. And maybe I am crying. I'm emotional today. <laughs> I will say really quickly on, on a side note, the amount of time that Violet mentions just her hatred of lifting weights is so funny and so relatable. I do not love weight training, but honestly, I do think I would like it a little bit more if Imogen was ordering me around. And that's not just because she's on my list of passes now. Well, hold on now too. If you knew that weight training would get you a very defined ass, let's just say that that would be some extra motivation for Zayden to be grabbing that junk in the trunk. He's an ass man. We know that, right? right? <laughs> making a hard shift to the right. It's not talked about enough how exhausting and terrifying it must be to be Bodhi, 
Imogen, Aya, and Violet, and obviously Mason and God fucking damn it, Kieran, who <laughs> left us too soon. R.I.P. My guy. <laughs> our, we never got the chance to hate you. They are walking around constantly thinking that someone might be around the corner to assassinate them. Literally, when Riddick comes up behind Violet, she, in one swift motion, has him up against the wall with a dagger at his throat. And even Imogen is described as, quote, her calm tone is at odds with the knife she clutches in her left hand. This kind of day-to-day anxiety would wear anyone down. I love that Riddick says, quote, I knew you were fast, but damn. I think Zayden, this is like little hints. We get quite a bit of hints at Violet being really fast this year. A lot of people have been like, oh my God, is this her second signet? We know from book one that speed is a lesser magic and Imogen and Zayden have really honed that in. Garrick has as well. So I'm guessing that in Violet's training with Zayden, he was also teaching her how to hone that lesser magic. We're going to get more into the PTSD side of Violet and what she's experiencing later on in this episode. But I just wanted to highlight that here, especially as Riddick accidentally almost loses his life. (laughs) Because Violet is so anxiety filled, which is fair. So fair. And now I loved this stretch of chapters. Some people thought it was really boring, but I actually really liked it. The land navigation trial. So on this podcast, I have been incredibly open about going into the writer's quadrant, having probably way more confidence than I actually would be able to have. But I'm not going to lie. The idea of being jumped at any moment for land nav or torture might just be enough to sway me into the healer's quadrant. I'm not going to lie. Those mind body retreats are sounding really good right about now. You know what does not sound good though is infantry. Would not touch that with a 10 foot pole. But I think it's also, I'm getting on my second (laughs) wing stomach. (laughs) Note that the other writers in this horror show of a class are from second wing. I'm pretty sure this is my new intrinsic level (laughs) obsession actually. (laughs) The more I bring it up, I'm like, yeah, this is it. Now, this is also the same squad leader that was the squad leader of Jacek, Sloan's opponent on the mat a chapter earlier. But I just wanted to point out that second wing, we're getting a lot of second wing and it's sus. I do want to also point out that the first year who Sloan was sparring with is not here in this trial because this is for second years only in the squad. So I said this in my reactions episode, but I'm going to say it again. Why the fuck do they consume anything that professor? Grady gives them. In our reactions episode, you had me second guessing my fury at this, Lexi. I'm going to keep going into my reasoning why. (laughs) I know you will, but I listened to this book with my husband. We're actually just at chapter 56 right now, so it was a good spot to leave off right before bed. But I'm listening to this book with my husband, a very Eagle Scout, should I mention, husband. And without me prompting anything, he also freaked out at them for drinking the water too. So I feel way less insane now that it was both of us being like, no, don't do it. Because he was just as adamant about don't drink it, don't do it as I was. If not more, we're theater kids. I hear you. And I'm not denying that it would be the sensible thing to do is to not drink it at all. Like hindsight is 2020. Just put yourself in these cadet shoes. No one could have comprehended that a serum like this exists. The cadets are horrified and shocked that this both exists and and is given to them. It's a new development this year, so there's no possible way to anticipate Vizgaeth would give them something to dull their powers, when in every other instance, the school is all about nurturing and harnessing this power with their dragons. I don't know if I necessarily put Professor Carr technically in that camp with his training, but you get my picture here. (laughs) Now, they were also just dropped in the middle of the woods with no supplies. The professor offers them water before this multi-day hike through an unknown forest. I'm just saying, like, why wouldn't the cadets think this was part of their send-off? I would have totally drank what Professor Grady gave me. Like, that's all I'll say. (laughs) I'm just saying I would have been the only one with powers, and I would have been laughing at everyone, being like, you idiots, I can still talk to my dragon. So many readers have a lot of issues with some of the decisions that our characters make in this book and this is definitely one of them and again I get it they shouldn't have but I have to explain why they did it's again their mindset like why would they think like that after once it happening I would not accept anything from anyone ever again and that includes Nolan and I will go into my whole reasoning why I can understand why she accepted that from Nolan but that is definitely a little bit more understandable but hey they don't drink it in one situation so you gotta give them some they credit they almost did they almost did but fucking brilliant woman Violet was like, this smells familiar. (laughs) God damn it. Uh. Okay, but let's talk about this poison. The poison cuts them off from their dragons. And if this sounds familiar, 
it should. Because at the end of Fourth Wing, when Violet is sliced by a green tipped poison dagger by the venom that she was fighting on Taryn's back, her magic and her connection to Taryn and Andarna is cut off. We know from Taryn that this is the first time that they're using this poison slash substance. The water here is described by Violet as pungent, earthy, and bitterly floral. Do you think that leadership models this substance after the poison that she got from the venom? Do you think that they're working with the venom to like trade goods and getting the poison in exchange? I'm going to not call this poison. I'm going to call this a serum because I think they are very different things. I wouldn't be surprised if this was inspired by the venom poison, but there are a few differences in the descriptions of the poison effects that I do want to call out here. In Fourth Wing, after Violet has been stabbed with this poison dagger, she feels cut off. She's no longer grounded. She can't feel Taryn or anyone in her head. She can't feel her feet on her mental archives floor. She's magically paralyzed in addition to physically. Now, while this best guy of the serum, which they create through like a concoction of, I want to say like herbs and kind of like poison ingredients that Violet would find, in this best guy of the serum, it's described as putting a blanket over their magic. The connection feels smothered, which I'll argue is different from feeling completely cut off like it was in the other one. Taryn later says that he can still sense Violet. So it's like a one-way connection where her way to reach him is blocked, but not his with her. I don't know if that's the same as we had at the end of Fourth Wing. I don't know if Taryn was able to reach her in that instance, I don't think so, but that's completely going off of memory here. Now, I do think that Biscayeth does not have the capability of creating a serum, poison, whatever you want to call it, that impacts the dragons magically too. Like, they just don't have that kind of power here. When Violet reaches for her power, she can still feel a tingle. Again, that feeling is feeling blanketed versus completely gone like the venom poison made her feel. I'm leaning toward it being created to primarily control the venom within the wards. Jack is a perfect example. And now they've perfected the serum they're extending it to the cadets because in the future it could be a powerful weapon against writers who are say looking to start another revolution oh that's good has Melgren seen something involving the serum like with the daggers in an upcoming battle this would have to be applicable to those who are not marked ones since he can't see them but I had to throw that out there because we do have that dagger reference later on if this is the case where they are specifically having the serum to control the venom then that makes Professor Grady a whole lot more sus than I originally thought. I'll say that about him. Oh, that does knock him down a peg on my favorites list, which is disappointing. To your point with the venom and stuff like that, if it is like putting a blanket over their power. So like when they would give this serum to Jack, I wonder if it would like take the craving away of being a venom. Because you know, Zayden at the very end in his POV basically says like he can feel it beneath him and he wants, like it's like, a, it's like a craving. And so I wonder if it takes the craving away. Is it a control substance? I was under the impression that it means that they wouldn't be able to channel because again, it, it blankets their ability to channel from the source. That was my understanding. So they essentially can't become more of a venom if they're under the serum. I wonder if in addition to being unable to channel, it would also take their craving away because that's really why people keep going down the path of venification is because they keep craving more and more. So if they're just saying, oh, you can't channel, but the craving's still there, you just have a bunch of crazed, starving venom running around like mad. And that brings me back to my point about Varish, though, because I think that he would absolutely have this craving. There is no way that he would test out being a venom and tapping into that power. And he definitely isn't under a serum. I mean, maybe with all that control language, but he still has his signet ability. So that would be completely different from what we have here. This does make me nervous for Zayden in book three because I don't think he would take the serum oh god I don't even want to go down that road all right yeah, well, we are getting ahead of ourselves it. here okay so if they are trying to however train these cadets for real life events why the fuck do they cut them off from their dragon that is not a real life situation even if they were on the ground they would still have the connection with their dragons they'd still have their signets is it just so that they're not fully dependent on them that's my understanding and as messed up as it is what they do, I can kind of understand why they do it. Because they do, they feel completely powerless. Because for the past year, our characters have been relying on their power, relying on their dragon bond for obvious reasons. They need to still be elite without their powers too. We also know that magic is wilder beyond the wards and it's more difficult for dragons to communicate outside of them. They're certainly still able to, but it's not as easy as it is within the wards. And we do also know that if there's a great distance between the person and their dragon, 
the strength of that connection fades. Like with Zayden and Violet's bond when he's at Samara. I know it's a little bit of a different scenario, but I think that does definitely apply there as well. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm actually going to agree with another aspect of RSC. And I literally cannot even believe I'm saying this. But with how chaotic it is, they needed to be put together sooner with other quadrants. They're just getting this insane ego show here between cadet asshole and even just Riddick. (laughs) Like, (laughs) good old Riddick. <laughs> Love Riddick, but man, he shows his colors here. I absolutely agree. I'm not surprised that the first year is focused on your own skills and your chosen quadrant. And then your second year is when it starts on more working together. I predict that third year includes even more teamwork with the other quadrants. This is a really fantastic team exercise, actually. <laughs> Nicole and I grew up very much in the personal development world with our parents. And like, this just reminds me of something that dad would put together. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, mine just is- without dragons. Yeah. I'm- killing you. <laughs> I don't think it's great that their powers are blocked. That's not cool. But again, I do get it because you have to prepare. I don't agree with a lot of the curriculum at Best Guyeth, but I am all for this land navigation trial. Same. Big same. Honestly, the infantry kind of needed to do this as well. Like the infantries are, they needed to be taken down a peg. It was a little crazy. Not saying that our riders didn't. Our riders definitely did. I think that there needs to be some kind of class about how to work with the other quadrants. Like in the infantry and all the other ones, it's like, hey, this is what happens when a dragon's around. And for our characters, it's like, okay, this is what the infantry does provide. Maybe it's a good idea for us to learn from them too. There's some better ways about going about this. But I think that, you know, throwing them all together in the middle of a forest, not knowing where to go is a great start here. (laughs) With dragons, make it life or death. I would maybe argue that point. Now, here's something I do want to point out is that Effie, who's the scribe of the crew, literally called where they were on day one. She says, quote, I think we're in the Haddon Woods, which Professor Grady later confirms you were in the Haddon Woods, but you guys were idiots and didn't figure it out. Miss Effie did. So listen to scribes more. That's what I learned from this section of the book is listen to scribes more. That brings me to my next point here, which is, oh my God, the egos. Even Violet recognizes her own ego when her first instinct is to tell the infantry captain, a captain, to fuck off because no writer answers to her. Even with Effie, Effie's the one who knows this from the beginning and Violet is so much of a writer now that she doesn't think, oh, hey, we should listen to the scribe. Like, I was kind of surprised that she wasn't a little bit more in tune yeah. with the scribe here. And then, of course, we already mentioned Reddick, who's outright like, well, technically we are above you because we ride dragons, which ugh, the poor infantry, like, how do you come back to that? How do you reply to that? Good point. <laughs> we even get an observation that the infantry cadet, who we assume is a squad leader, steps up to grab one of the maps, but the two rider squad leaders grab them instead. And he's like, oh, and then he kind of shrinks back. Even though Professor Professor Grady says land navigation has been a course for the infantry since year one. They're going to be a lot better at this than you are. And Rhi and Tomas are still like, let's just go get our maps. That little line right there is such a subtle way of show don't tell with these writer egos. Like, yes, I mean, we get the full egos on display here in a very big telling ways. But these little moments too, it shows that, hey, the dragon riders, they're the elite, they're in charge, and they won't accept any less. And they probably should have actually listened to the infantry in this situation. (laughs) We get a lot of new names in this scene. So I think that it'll be helpful to list out each of them to give our readers clarity on who's who and which quadrant they're in. First of all, everyone here is a second year and they are among the best in their year. We have our second squad from fourth wing, Rian and Sawyer, Riddick and Violet. We have four riders from second squad, flame section, second wing. Second wing. We have Tomas, who's a squad leader and a suit to be Pile of Ashes, RIP. We have Mirabelle or Maribel, depending on the page, because the section of the book really, really needed an extra round of editing. I We're not going to talk about that too much in this podcast because there's other things to talk about, but had to point that out. She has shoulder length, dark blonde braid, pale skin, and she's a fire wielder. Brissa has a shaved head. She has rich brown skin, and she's very observant. And then lastly, we have Cohen, who has short black hair and brown skin. Now we move on to the two groups of the eight infantry cadets. Four men, four women. Each group has a squad leader. Calvin, who's their ranking officer and the equivalent of Dane. The only other name we get from the infantry is Gwen, aka Cadet Quiet. She's a curvy brunette with brown eyes, and she's also very observant like Brissa. Then we move on to the two healer cadets. We know one's named Dyer, who may be the best in his year, but he sucks at being in land nav and facing dragons. (laughs) Lastly, we have the scribe, Effie, who has red hair, lots of freckles, and she's even shorter than Violet, who is 5'2". I'm so glad you did that because as I was reading this section, I was like, man, I wish I had a list of just everyone. And then I didn't even read this part of the outline when you 
literally had it. We talked about Bade's breath and the dank huff of steam last episode, so I'm not going to cover that here. But what I do want to say that stood out to me was her poison barbed tail. We know another dragon who gets a poisoned tail, which is Andarna. And this made me start thinking, like, is this much much more common when we, than we thought? Or is this just a standard for scorpion tails? Yes, scorpion tails have poison barbed tails. That's the weapon of their tail there. Oh. So I was doing a double check of this in fourth wing, and I actually did catch something. Maybe it's nothing, but it's worth calling out. The horde of wyvern in the Resin battle, they also had poison barbed tails. So it made me wonder, are there tails where the venom green poison comes from? Oh. <gasps> I, it does make me wonder also, what is the poison on Andarna's, and I'm assuming Bade's, because I'm assuming it's the same one, what is the poison on their tails? What is it? Is it just like deadly poison? Is I'm, it some kind of poison? That's a good question. I hope we find out. Okay. I hope so too. Riddick brings up a really good point. He says, quote, it's not like other dragons are waiting behind enemy lines to kill us. To which Violet mistakenly says, you'd be surprised. Woof, Violet. Why are they letting them be hunted by dragons? <laughs> Is this a rare instance of Bezgaeth actually preparing them for the war that they're going to be fighting? Is this Professor Grady's workaround? This is me defending my guy, <laughs> Professor Grady. Is this his way of a workaround to actually teach them what they're going to be up against while drugged? Or is this more for the other quadrants to learn how to actually interact with dragons? That was my understanding. Plus, they need, they just need to make the land nav trial more deadly. It's Biscayeth after all. So let's Evans. just add in some dragon hunting for you. I do believe it's also supposed to help foster the teamwork and survival circumstances here among the four quadrants. Writers have to teach the others about how to be around dragons and the others teach writers everything else. So I think that that was definitely part of the dynamic too. So is this just so writers can feel useful during land nav? Because that's what I'm getting now. <laughs> is that just so that's, that they can feel useful? That is actually a very good point. Yes. <laughs> Fucking writers. All right, moving on to the chapter 16 opening. Lexi, the way my jaw dropped when I read this for the first time and learned that Fen Ryerson was in the infantry quadrant. This was not on my bingo card. I didn't think so either. But in a later chapter, it says, quote, most of the aristocracy chooses to serve in the infantry, just like Zayden's father, because writers are discouraged from holding their family seats. Not only are our commissions lifelong instead of the few years that the infantry offers agree to, but too much power in one person terrifies any king, unquote. I would also imagine that the death rate isn't great for the lines of succession, but, but it, it makes sense. I was just shocked that Fen was not a writer. I was too. And I think it actually makes a little bit more sense that the rebellion wasn't full of just a bunch of writers. I feel like a lot of us kind of made that assumption and it's actually not true. A lot more of the infantry was involved than I think that we realized that. Yeah, it was such a surprise when I read it, but like you, like once when I thought about it, it's like, oh, like that actually does make sense. And I love how it's explained here about why that's the case. It does also make me think that if, for instance, a writer like Arik does take the throne at the end of this book series, would that be less of a threat, quote unquote? Would he be more okay with other writers taking duke or duchess statuses in different regions it just makes me think that maybe it's just also a little bit of napoleon syndrome in the fact that they're not writers on the throne and they don't want to be overpowered by writers on any duchess or duke throne as well in the archives so violet comes back from land nav and she absolutely capital f fails now later on in the book she says i've never failed anything in my entire life but she failed land nav <laughs> I, I think, think she might address that. I but. think that it was a little bit more of like her as her own person has never failed. And I don't remember that part in particular, but this was a collective fail. <laughs> But she comes back from failing land nav and she goes straight to the archives because she has a free afternoon. And this is from Jacinia. Quote, stories can change depending on who tells them. How very meta considering the fact that she is the one, if not writing, she is at least translating the story that we are currently reading. But this is also such a good like wink, wink, hint, hint that she suspects way more than she lets on. Just justice for Jacinia. She deserves so much more energy and love and passion behind her than she gets for a lot of people, but we will be your advocates, Jacinia. What do you think happened, though, at the attack that Jacek's family was killed at? This is the attack that literally got him, Jacek. This is 
Sloane's opponent's older brother killed. I'm assuming that this was a venom attack, but why didn't they just brush it under the rug as poor Emil unrest like they did with Resin? Or was it something way more intense? I feel like they couldn't hide the carnage from Resin because of all the fallen wyvern. So that was a somewhat unique instance where they did have to lie. First cover it up and not have a report at all like what happens here. A lot of border villages are remote and only receive news provided by Biscayeth. Sawyer later confirms this in the book. So it wouldn't be too difficult to cover cover up a venom attack like this. What if the venom and wyvern attack left no survivors? Or, this is terrible to even say, Biscayeth didn't let there be any survivors because they know what destroyed their village. And, oh God, like how fucked up is that? Like, I don't even want to say that. I think that. it's accurate though. <laughs> so this is a reoccurring question from Fourth Wing too. Is Battle Breathe purposefully making it seem like there are fewer griffin attacks than there really are? Or are they only hiding the venom attacks? It brings me back to the missive Markham received last year that Violet and Liam accidentally read. Now, in this case that we're talking about now, how would Jacek know his family was killed there if there were? no survivors. He had letter writing privileges for one, so maybe something with that. This is also assuming that the attack was after conscription day when his first year brother came to the quadrant. That's a good question. Yeah. How did he know? Huh. Yeah, or maybe his brother saw what happened and when he came for conscription day. And that's why he was turned Ben in. <laughs> I really do think he was just pissed off that his brother had died. But anyway, but so maybe his brother told him about what had happened in their village. I don't know, but just something to wonder about there. But I do definitely think that this was Venon because there was no report whatsoever. One little small note in this Jacinium passage we get with her. I love seeing all of these little notes of Violet's inner monologue. I could get Jacinia killed, etc. There's like a lot in this little chapter. But knowing that Jacinia is the only character that we have 100% assurance that she lives, I am thanking gods for that certainty. I love how Jacinia comes to these conclusions on her own. You know, you were kind of mentioning that a little while ago here, but scribes just think differently. And what started as a thought to be innocent inquiry has led Jacinia down, you know, she's been following the breadcrumbs or lack thereof breadcrumbs. And it just shows how this big Navarian secret is built on a house of cards. One stray piece of information, like the fables book or simply the word wyvern can potentially unravel this carefully built lie. No wonder leadership is so strict on any info leaking, including someone asking about a border attack that doesn't exist. No wonder why they don't kill anyone just right off the bat. Golly. Jacinia asks for something in return, though, which we later learn in the stretch of chapters that it is Violet's copy of the fables of the Baron. What I would not give to hear Jacinia's thoughts on that, but like un- unfiltered thoughts. I think she was feeling filtering quite a bit because Zayden was there when she was handing the book back. But what I wouldn't give for Justinia's thoughts like on that book. She's subtly becoming one of my low-key favorite characters in these books. Yes. <laughs> you think she's all sweet and innocent and then <gasps> she asks for a forbidden book <gasps> in exchange for the treason she's committing. Like I just love her so much. She's like such like a like innocent character, but wait. <laughs> She's turning into such a badass and I'm here for it. Let's talk about the sparring challenges. This is our second round of sparring scenes in this book. This sounds like the middle of a fourth wing slash Iron Flame Empyrean novel. (laughs) Sparring challenges just dripped throughout the book. You know, it kind of threw me off in this book how much Violet doesn't want to learn the first year's names. But then, you know, I think about in fourth wing and how the death roll gradually started taking on a new meaning as she recognized more names. She associates with facts, dates, locations, names, and she doesn't want to know these facts, these names names as a way to protect herself. Not knowing these other people's names is a small way of making life at Biscayeth a tiny bit easier on Violet when everything else feels so hard. It is a psychological survival skill that she has to put to use to keep going every single day, especially after Liam's death. Quinn admitting that Sloane isn't just a first year, she is the one, remember, who advised not to get close to any first year after threshing, but she's also not a marked one. So I really think that this demonstrates her friendship with Emogen and how much she supports her friend who truly does care about Sloane. So therefore, Quinn breaks her own rule and also cares. Plus, Liam was part of this squad, which is Quinn's squad too. It just goes to show the impression Liam made and the love his squad felt for him, which has extended to his sister, even though she is absolutely nothing like him. I will say this, Quinn saying like, oh, she's more than just a first year and Arik is literally also in their squad. A prince is very funny. (laughs) That's a good call there. (laughs) So this is an interesting moment that really stood out to me. And again, it's 
typical Rebecca Yaros, just dropping these like really big moments in just standard dialogue that you just read over, at least on the first read. So when Riddick went to see Nolan, he said that he saw him walking out of the super secret room with an air wielder who looked just as haggard. Was the air wielder keeping Jack fucking Barlow in line? Is this another Venom who that leadership is creating? Perhaps in second wing, maybe? What is this air wielder who's looking just as haggard? What do they have to do with Nolan and his work? I have a theory. <laughs> I'm so excited for this. So I was also wondering what an air wielder is doing with Jack and Nolan. I do believe that he is one of the controllers, certainly not one of the controllees. So jumping ahead in the book to the Athbane meeting with General Melgren, we learn about Colonel Fremont, who is a very powerful air wielder and a previous aide to General Sorengale. He can, and I quote, suck the air straight out of your lungs. Now that is a very specific body manipulation call out attached to an air wielder. Back in Riddick's observation, here that an air wielder was walking out of Nolan and Barish's secret room in the infirmary with Nolan and looking just as haggard. First of all, I don't think that this is Colonel Fremont. He's too high up to be doing this kind of stuff. But I do think that air wielders work well with menders. I'm sure that some signets pair really well together on certain initiatives, combining to essentially create new powers or to strengthen one of the other powers. I have no idea how this would work, but what if the air wielder is able to push the mender's healing ability further to its target. I'm not talking about broken bones. We know that's easy for Nolan or should be easy if he wasn't so haggard. What if they're targeting the soul? which we know that Nolan is trying to mend a soul and the air wielder is extending the mender's power to guide it to where it uniquely needs to go. Like I just mentioned, Nolan exclaims at some point how difficult it is to mend a soul. He's got to be talking about at least Jack. What if an air wielder works with Nolan on trying to mend these venom because their signet uniquely strengthens Nolan's mending ability, especially right now when neither of them are doing their best work. We see the signet duo later with Violet and her mom too when her mom calls the storm that then strengthens Violet's lightning signet. So I just like, I thought about that and I was like, that's gotta be it, right? So are you saying like the air wielder is almost like the Drano? Like they're unclogging the pathway? No, I think that they're more guiding the mending power to the location. So it's almost like trapping the mending power in this little air pocket or whatever they're doing and then manipulating it to the straight to straight to the soul something to that effect yes I love this idea. I'm excited. I hope that we explore more about signets and the duality of certain signets together because we've seen multiple examples of this throughout both of our books now. And I just, I want to see more of it. And I think that this might be a little hint of one of those combos. I love this. I'm going to talk about something way <laughs> less magical and mystical. There are multiple Easter eggs that us as a fandom have decided, and I believe rightfully so, that are nods to Rebecca Yaros's Taylor's Swift love. So we know from an EW video that she wrote a lot of Iron Flame to Miss Americana and the Heartbreak Prince. She also went to the Eras Tour opening weekend with her husband, which, oh my God, what I wouldn't have given to go to that. I did not get tickets or have the finances to get tickets for that. <laughs> but the lines like this, and this is Violet to Sloan, quote, I don't need to be a part of your development era. This has to be a nod to Taylor Swift. It's like, tell me you're a Swifty without telling me you're a Swifty. <laughs> I've actually been using this era phrase a lot recently too, mostly about my children because, oh man, are they going through their own eras. Whew. <laughs> Just a little thing to note, the way that Violet and Imogen stand with ease, they're not stumbling as they gain their feet, unlike the first years. There are so many little descriptions like this throughout the book that show just how much the past year has strengthened and changed Violet specifically, mentally and physically. I just love those little lines there. Last thing in this sparring session, I need to know what is in Liam's letters. We'll talk more about what might be in his letters later, like did Liam have a second signet? But right now, I want to give Violet a round of applause for this clever scheme. Liam's letters will be vital to Sloane's character growth and development as she largely has her development era off page. We have to trust Liam and what he wrote in his letters to help her through this while we keep focusing on our main character stories. Moving into the next section, we get a unabridged history of the first six. Violet in her inner monologue is recapping what she's learning from this book and how it's 
not helpful, I would argue, because we get, quote, but while it goes into details about the complex interpersonal relationships of the first six, that sounds fascinating. I don't know about you. That sounds fascinating. Continuing. And even a little bit of their battle experiences during the Great War, it simply labels the enemy as General Daramore and our allies as the Isle Kingdoms, unquote. Two things here. One, General Daramore, general, sounds like the mavens that are the generals of the venom. Would this be a clue that General Daramore is, he's one of the mavens? I am 100% convinced of this. Ask me again at the end of this reread, but right now, 1000% yes. Now, last episode, we did also speculate about an ancient king and if he is his venom general role as well. I personally think that there are more than one but I definitely oh, think yeah. that this General Daramore is absolutely one of the big bad venom. Oh, yeah. Now, the second thing I want to point out here is the Isle Kingdoms. We get so many mentions of the Isle Kingdoms in this book, and I cannot help but think that it is only a matter of time before we travel to them in our story. Give me all the Devarelli silk. You know, Violet's got her own book subscription here at Biscayeth. It's kind of like Book of the Month, actually, which helps readers find books that they may not have discovered otherwise with a focus on new and emerging authors. And because they know book lovers are also on the move like us, Book of the Month also now offers audiobook options with your membership. Every month, you can choose one physical or audiobook from a carefully curated list of featured books. This month, actually, Lexi, I chose This Spells Love by Kate Robb. I saw Witty, Whimsical, Friends to Lovers, and a Romance, and I immediately said, sign me up. I'd like that book. That sounds like a nice palate cleanser after Iron Flame. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So if you are also needing your next palate cleanser, or, or hey, just your next book or two or three, go to our link in our show notes here or bookofthemonth.com and use code SWEATER, S-W-E-A-T-E-R, SWEATER, and get your first book for only $5. So the chapter 17 epigraph, we get another mention of the ancestral hatching grounds of each dragon breed and how it was a big sacrifice for the dragons when establishing Navarre under the first wards. I'm not quite ready to dive into these ancestral hatching grounds that keep popping up in our story, but I just needed to call it out to get our gears going because, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I also just have to say, I love these epigraphs because you don't miss anything in the story itself if you just skim over them, but they really do provide so much additional context for this world's history, character characters, and locations. And for every answer they give, even more questions pop up. We know that they're just offering the tiniest sliver of the bigger picture, mostly because the text is taken out of their full context. I just, I love these epigraphs so, so, so much. There are certain ones that I'm like, can we please just get full books? Like almost how we got like Quidditch Through the Ages or like the Tales of Beetle the Bard. Like I want a book of some of these epigraphs. Give me all of Zayden Ryers and letters. I want those, please. I was just going to say, I want the dragon kind book. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> Emogen, once again, coming in with the facts. She is that tough love friend we all need sometimes. I love how Violet's getting a little defensive and Emogen just pushes back with, you'd have the same problem with any writer you dated. This is literally Emogen saying, hey, you want to date that CIA agent and you're blaming him for not sharing everything with you? Then the kicker. If Violet truly wanted to date a morally gray shadow daddy Zayden, then gets pissed that he has secrets, then hey, she's been lying to herself. Damn, if this is not just a slice of reality pie, but like we all need an image in our lives. And then we get the battle axe analogy, which we can all laugh about and give Violet a hard time about with not trusting Zayden. But once again, I need to remind readers that Violet's life has always felt grounded in knowledge. There is an answer to everything and she can seek it out and find it. With Zayden, she can't get answers to what she wants. And what's worse in her subconscious, she doesn't even know what she wants to know, which just sends her even more spiraling and caught up in these tangled emotions all the more and all the time. I'm not disagreeing that her inner dialogue can be frustrating and annoying to follow. She is a 21-year-old in a complicated relationship, but I am defending her character because she has a lot of complicated feelings that feel real for who she is, what she's gone through, and what she's working towards. I'm going to always defend Violet's character and Rebecca's writing choices with her here. On a side note, though, Rebecca Yaros in interviews has been praised for her analogies that she uses to explain certain fantastical elements of the world, 
like the CIA agent is one. And I love seeing that shine through Violet, the battle axe analogy, you know, it's just so cool to see a little bit of her in Violet, because I do think that she connects with Violet so, so much. And it's just, it's fun to see that parallel. Lastly, about Imogen here, she counters Satan's advice about distancing from Violet's friends. She is part of the squad and sees Violet and her friends every single day. She knows that they're a family. She knows that Violet needs them in a firsthand way that Zayden just can't understand. But is Imogen saying that she should tell Rhiannon what happened or just confide in Rhiannon about Zayden? I think that it's a lot more about Zayden and just because you have secrets doesn't mean that you can't have friends. I think that that's what she's trying to convey here. I'm not going to lie. This is Zayden taking a big L with the whole like distance yourself from people. Also note that when Imogen is like weird that Ryerson is writing letters, Violet says, really? I think it's sweet. Violet regularly describes Zayden as sweet in both Fourth Wing and Iron Flame. I'm pointing this out very specifically. And as a wink, wink, hint, hint, because I will be talking about this in a very specific way in a future episode. What do we think of the pamphlet Re received from her family along with their letter? Quote, beware of strangers seeking shelter. It's my understanding that these border villages are seeing more poor meal migrants trying to get to safety within the borders. And it's civilians like this that are seeking refuge. They're the ones who are killed at Samara, which we learn later on. I'm guessing that this propaganda is another tactic to turn the Navarre citizens against these refugees. This was also my understanding, and it's fucking heartbreaking. And it also, when Violet later asks, like, I'm assuming you're taking people in at Eurasia, and Zayden's like, of course we are. And just like seeing that polar opposite reaction. Now, I do want to know, do you think that Markham is the one who led this declaration to all or this propaganda to all the border villages if he didn't directly do this one i think that he's at least at the very top of the food chain and it's all trickling down from him markham says that there's been an alarming number of attempted border crossings in the mountain villages near strategic outposts i went back to the early chapters in our story here to the map in arisha with the venom battle mark sites and found this the red flags are all from the last few years, and they are heavily concentrated in the northern plains of poor meal, spreading like a disease from the southeast barrens. Everyone, you might want to pull out your maps for this year. These red dots are even in Signison, the smallest and most northern poor meal province. Now, Montserrat and these mountain villages are right at the Signison borders. So that makes absolute sense why there have been so many attempted border crossings in these northern mountains. Venon have been attacking this region for up to a few years, longer than most other parts of poor meal, and its citizens are learning that they have no other choice than to try and cross into Navarre, knowing that their whole territory isn't safe. How does Navarre counter that, especially if there isn't enough military to stop every single poor meal citizen seeking refuge, besides Montserrat, which does bring in another infantry company, approximately 200 people. They came there for security, both to block these border crossers and probably kill them, and to be on alert for Venon because Navarre now knows how dangerous the northern mountains are. Navarre is instilling propaganda in the villages. They're sowing the seeds of distrust and hatred for their border neighbors. So when poor Emilians start saying, hey, there are wyvern attacks, everybody, or maybe they just think they're evil dragons, whatever the word that they're using for wyvern is, Navarians automatically won't believe them and instead think that they have ill intent. This is fucked up. Like, this is so fucked up. And I'm not going to lie. It's fucking brilliant from Navarre leadership. Yeah, I mean, like in a horrific way. I love this part about Devera. Her body language and how it responds to Markham's lies in this battle brief really do make me wonder if this is the moment when she got the idea to spread real information in a similar pamphlet style for battle brief later. Oh, I totally love that idea. Yes. There's this moment where it says, quote, Devera shifts her weight, then lifts her chin looking at us. It's just like those little teeny tiny things. Shifts her weight, lifts her chin. That is show, don't tell on full display display and it's priming us to absolutely get on board when Devera is like I will join the revolution and we're like yes Devera <laughs> now I do want to share something that gave me pause Markham says that there were authorized classified missions to check on the cities that these poor millions claim have been destroyed by dragons aka wyvern and that these riots have reported that the cities are actually intact how does that happen Either, number one, the riots did not report that they were fine, but I don't think that like they would all just be killed for being sent to check on something that leadership probably knows wasn't true, so I don't think that this is the right answer. Number two, the riots were in on the Venon secret and purposefully gave a false report. Very few people in Navarre know about this big secret, though, and it's mostly the higher-ups. Now, do they have their minions go and do things like go see if poor male cities are destroyed? 
probably, but there's still a lot of trust to put in multiple writers unless, got to throw this out there, unless the writers are controlled venom themselves. I still don't know how far they're taking this control of the venom thing, but I just, again, had to throw this out there. Number three, or these riots were never sent. They never checked on these cities. How convenient that these were classified missions and once completed, they gave the exact report that supports the leadership's theory and can quell civilian anxiety. And it all plays into the propaganda that these poor male citizens are lying. I definitely think it's door number three here. Oh yeah, same. Devera does choose her words carefully, focusing on what the reports said. It's again giving us a little hint that she knows that the reports are lying. Now, as Violet is listening to this in Battle Brief, she starts to have what I can only, my heart just so aches for Violet. I don't know if you've ever actually had one, Lex. We both have high anxiety. That's actually not surprising. Yeah, but (laughs) my heart just so aches for Violet as she's here absolutely panicking and she runs to the one place where she can feel in control. I love how her running is described. It's so automatic as if Violet's whole body took over in autopilot and survival mode and she sprinted to the one place that she feels ironically safe. Speaking of irony, the irony that in her mind she's always describing the archives, you know, like the whole like tearing and channeling and foot and grounding, all that kind of stuff. It is her mental archives. Her mind is so panicked that she literally cannot rely on her mental archives. She almost has to be in the actual archives to get a hold of her mental faculties. Like that is just so freaking beautifully written. I love that. And that's that's a far more eloquent way of saying it than Taryn did. But Shock man, of shocks. He was not supportive <laughs> in that moment. <laughs> Violet's exchange with Jacinia here is just amazing, especially how Jacinia points out that Violet gave her a choice. I will say that this is a little bit different from Jacinia's situation. She figured out the basics on her own and she's smuggling books in and out. Versus if the squad was given a choice, which involves having to tell them more than Jacinia was told. But the ultimate choice here is the same. Are they willing to risk their lives for civilization? That's exactly what Jasenia is doing. She may not be a writer, but I'm sure she would be killed if she was found out here. Oh, yeah. And also just to say, how they don't get caught before Violet is caught for the vault heist is just beyond me, especially when there are so many watchful eyes on Violet. You know, they're waiting for her to slip up, like go to the archives when she's not supposed to be there. I I will say, however, her previous life training for Scribehood, it really is helping her out here, causing no one to question what she's doing in the archives, when that wouldn't actually be the case for any other writer. Hence why the archives and scribes were completely out of the question until she came along. Oh, yeah. The chapter 18 epigraph, it reminds me almost like of a game of telephone. So it's a statement and then it's like transcribed by this scribe, redacted and transcribed by this scribe, transcribed again by this scribe. Like it's like three different levels of translation or translated and redacted by. And honestly, even if they weren't actively hiding massive amounts of information, what a terrible way to tell history. I see the irony now in this outline that that is how we told history for a long time, and I guess still do. But stuff, of of course, is going to get lost in the sauce. I think this passage here just shows us how many hands things go through in the archives. Of course, things are going to get redacted, changed, left out 200 years altogether. But I think this passage is here to show us just how many hands things go through in the archives. Now, Lexi, Zaddy's back. (laughs) God, I missed him. God, I missed my man. Zayden Ryerson flirting will never get old. But Zayden Ryerson saying, you think I'm beautiful? Well, basically blushing is my undoing, I will say. And then he says, say those three little words and I'll have you naked in seconds. And I'm like, nope. Flirting, dominate, Zayden, perfect, ever, never change, my guy. (laughs) I love this line, though, because it literally sums up their relationship in a sentence. Quote, ironic that it's my truthfulness that can put me out of my own misery when it's his candor I crave. We're not going to get on the whole defending how they're acting in their relationship and all that kind of stuff right now. But I am very firmly, this this never felt annoying to me in the book. I do have a question. Why do you think Lilith never shipped off her books to storage? Nothing was touched in Violet's old room, and she was really surprised, almost chalking it up to Lilith being, dare I say, sentimental. But why do you think Lilith literally did not touch a single thing? I figured it was down to her mom's faith that she would survive the writer's quadrant. There's no reason to pack up her things, potentially to be burned, if she'll be back to visit the room. Or maybe it was that her mom knew Violet, being the scribe that she is, would have valuable things in her room, books, journals, fables and wanted her to have access to them when she was allowed. I do wonder if she knew that Papa Soren Gale gave her some things 
like the Book of Fables. And the reason she didn't pack it up is because she didn't want watchful eyes looking through her stuff in storage. And so instead, she was like, I'm just going to lock this room up. I was going to say, what if her mom warded her room so that (gasps) nobody could go in there? Except for Violet. Except for Violet. I like that. That that would make sense to me. And Lexi, it is time for another round of Intrinsic or is it the Bond? Zayden is starting to piece together why Violet is surrounded by all these books. She says in her mind... No italics, friends. Quote, I draw the line at outright lying to him. Then, quote, a tick of his jaw later and his gaze jumps to mine. You're hiding something from me. So is this intrinsic bond or I'm also going to throw out just Zayden being an intelligent puppy? (laughs) I actually think that it's Zayden just being really smart here. I want to believe that he is actually respecting her privacy like you said he was. And he's at least trying not to read her intention. It's as he admits later on, sometimes it does just happen accidentally because of how strong their bond is, but I don't think that he's actively trying to read her intentions here. I do believe, however, that he is fantastic at picking up on body language because he is observant and has learned telltale signs from being an intrinsic. He's able to read their mind and body language at the same time, which makes him even better at reading body language. So... I think that it's just him reading her body language, knowing her super well, and chalking it all up to she's hiding something. This is a rare moment when I am going to say it is not intrinsic. I do agree with you. I think that this is Zayden just being smart. I love this idea of him being able to pick up on body language so much quicker. Now, I have questions for him about how often he actually does read her mind. So I'm going to get into those when we cover chapters 56. But I think I'm going to go with smart, even though intrinsic is pretty convincing here. (laughs) I am also cackling at the idea of Zayden and Violet fighting literally face to face. Like it is mentioned that they are a breath away from each other, but silent. Like there's someone on TikTok who has a video who describes it perfectly. And YouTubers, this is just for you because audio, you will hear nothing. Literally, it's like this guy who's eating popcorn. He's like, and then it cuts to him again. And he's like, And I'm going to link the video in the show notes so you can know what I'm talking about. But there's my reenaction of it. (laughs) But it just, it it kills me. This idea of them being so close together and just like (laughs) fighting like that. And Riddick just being like, they're not even speaking. (laughs) It does make me realize though, I guess Violet didn't tell anyone about her mind to mind connection with Zayden, which I don't know why in my head canon, people just like knew. I was under the impression that people might know and it not be common knowledge but for people to maybe know because you know they all know that their dragons are mated and so therefore that they have this bond as well however only liam knew last year so that does make me wonder i kind of am thinking that this here is the moment when the crew picks up that vi and zayden are able to speak mind to mind because riddick doesn't really know what they're saying i feel like he would have a good jab at their mind to mind connection if he did understand so i think that this is the enlightening moment for all of them. And again, I love my guy Zayden, but he is taking another L here, being an asshole to her friends. I guess we have to get some morally gray in here sometimes. He's been way too sweet because all we see is him and Violet together. So we had to be reminded that he is indeed an asshole. But I just, I also love how Violet defends her friends and she pushes back on him. Same. I think that defending was definitely needed because he was being an asshole. Let's talk about Nolan again, the guy who (sighs) needs a nap. And the way that Zayden insists Violet put her shields back up and she's like, oh, it's only Nolan. Girl, if only you knew. But this is such a good example that primes up for why she accepts his offer for Lemonade. You were going on and on about how why would she ever do that? I think that this is a great reason about why. She wouldn't even put her shields up for him, let alone not accept Lemonade from him. She trusts Nolan wholeheartedly, which again is stupid, but she does. And I can understand why. He has been mending her for six years. He's been taking care of her. She trusts him with her life. But hey, guess what? That's just not enough anymore in this world. Damn it. You make a good point. Maybe I'll forgive her for (laughs) drinking Nolan's lemonade. (laughs) Fine. And this is the moment when he says mending a soul. Is he so tired that he just let this slip? Like, why did Violet not think twice about this? I realize that she would not have any idea what he meant by this, but she doesn't even wonder. Like, No, she does wonder. She wonders if it's a joke. And then he changes the subject. Hmm. But I just... Violet, why didn't you pick up on that just a tiny bit more and wonder? First and foremost, how the fuck did I miss this? I did not even pick up on this. But secondly, what if he wasn't slipping? He later helps them escape from interrogation. What if this is his way of like dribbling information to her? What if he is trying to be like mending a soul? Wink, wink. 
Hint, hint, Violet, Zayden. And then they all just kept going on with their day, huh? And they just didn't <laughs> think about it. So but on that same note that maybe Nolan is actually good, is he in any way trying to get himself out of this horrendous situation? Or is he on the side of Navarre leadership specifically, where he almost wants to learn about the Venom and what they are? I mean, Homeboy is haggard and he's almost in a slow form of torture himself is he trying to get himself out or is he just like accepting his fate or is he curious as leadership is oh that's interesting I feel like when it comes to interrogations he's kind of accepted his fate he just understands that this is part of what it is the way that he does side with leadership on a moral stance when he slips that lemonade to Violet I do think that he is ultimately on their side however I think that he is still ultimately a good person and that he's a great example of a character that can coexist in both of those realms. Okay, we need to talk about Caroline Ashton because what the hell? (laughs) Obviously, it has to do with Jack. So is she part of these experiments? Like in Hunger Games book three, when PETA is brainwashed and they bring people from his past in to see how he's improving, like maybe she's part of it in that context where she's that person from his past who comes in to see essentially how he's doing and if he recognizes her, if he's nice to her, if he's not trying to kill her, that kind of thing. Is she helping take care of him? That feels like more informal than what she's doing here with Nolan. Does it have anything to do with her signet? Probably not. Is she visiting Jack for the first time? We've still got a few more weeks before Jack returns to the quadrant. So maybe this is just like her first visit or one of her first visits. Again, no, I don't think that she would be told that he's still alive and just like allowed to visit. I think that she has a very specific purpose, which is why I think she's part of the mending a soul attempt as the person he's close to to help ground him in his humanity. I can't even believe I just said that about Jack and Carol. Caroline, why the hell did he have to come back, Nicole? I mean, I I get it. I do, but I don't at the same time, and I'm still working through it. (laughs) Ultimately, this is all a very strange exchange with Nolan and Caroline coming to the infirmary, but I know it'll make more sense later. I'm calling it now that we will find out more about Caroline in book three when Jack's character is explored more. I can't believe I'm saying these words. I can't wait to learn more about Jack in book three. I can't (laughs) believe that I'm saying that, but it's so true. (sighs) We need to talk about this sleeping screen ride at Nasia. So I love to poke fun at Nasia for being just terrible at his job and how he's always sleeping whenever Violet goes into the archives on Saturday. But it did make me wonder, is there something more to this? Like it would be ludicrous for somewhere as important to this top secret sneaky mission that leadership is doing in the archives to be this poorly guarded. So here's my question. Is someone drugging Nasia? So he sleeps and then they can sneak into an almost empty archive on Saturday. Are you thinking Jasenia is doing this? I want that. Now I am. I want that. Like, I just love her and her low key, like Gryffindor-esque-ness. And I just like, I'm here for it. Yes. She's the one who's drugging him to sleep. I'm so here for this idea. That convinced. <laughs> Absolutely. It's Jacinia. Now, the first time that this happens, I don't think that she knew that Violet was coming and he was asleep already, but just having fun here. Because <laughs> I mean, who else would it be? Like, why would leadership drug? I mean, un- unless they're trying to get somewhere in the archives that they don't get normally or maybe it's Arik. oh i like Could this see that. i like this let's talk about something less fun and that is zayden and violet fighting again as much as i <laughs> <laughs> again as much as i hate seeing them fight you know we love seeing them steamy we love seeing them flirting their banter their happy happiness i also just can't help but find this so accurate so realistic of course they would finally reach this point where it's not just little jabs here and there it is like a full out word brawl but I do have to say props to Zayden who leaves Zayden has taken a lot of L's in this episode so I'm going to give him one small prop now I'm going to give him a bigger prop I'm going to give him a medium to large size prop here who leaves because he knows he's going to say something that he regrets later and props to Violet in return who registered this as him needing space and so she does not go after him we have to remember that they are in their early 20s this is a very mature move hell 
I'm still working on this in my relationship. <laughs> it, this kind of pause and arguing, it's definitely happened between my husband and I, especially after being together for 10 years. Sometimes you really are just too heated to have a rational conversation and you just have to acknowledge that and politely excuse yourself. It's the most mature thing to do. And then we come back later to talk, not argue, and to truly listen to the other while being able to share our feelings in a productive manner. As soon as I saw this on the page, I was like, I can definitely relate to this. I need to get better at this. I'm going to be super honest. And maybe I'll take some inspiration from Zayden. I also can't help but think, though, that when Violet says either of us could be killed at any moment and the last words we said to each other were in anger, I can't help but think of Zayden's dad. Him and Fen had a big fight right before he left to whatever became the Battle of Eurasia. So I wonder if this was also an immediate thought of Zayden's. And because of that, and because that's something he regrets so deeply, we see this later on in part two specifically, I'm kind of surprised that he just like snuck in and grabbed his things and didn't try to make amends before he goes back to literally the front lines. I did not think about that. That is a good call out. Before we dive into Taryn, which I cannot wait, Reed knows that there is something off about Solus, and I must say, I agree. There's theories of Bruin that we will touch on later, but I think that these smaller oranges with bad character judgment can be manipulated by their writers. Is that why they go for the aggressive writers, like to compensate? <laughs> what are you saying about Brennan then? Brennan has a very powerful signet, so I feel like his orange is a little bit more powerful, is probably a little bit bigger, but... There's also some sus stuff around Brennan that a lot of the fandom is starting to wonder about. So we're going to put a pin in that for right now and go back to this moment here. <laughs> There's also a lot to consider about Venon possibilities here and how that factors into these weird dragon bonds. We even get a Sawyer line that Varish seems so controlled, that control language here again. Again, we will explore this in way more depth at a later time, but I do think that there is something to these smaller oranges who are being manipulated. I don't want to go so far as to say controlled by their writers, but they specifically have aggressive writers for a reason. Now we can talk about Taryn. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I loved this part so much. I think this actually might be weirdly one of my favorite parts of the book. I've been giving Taryn a pretty hard time for not following through with his threats. And while he has still not eaten anyone in this instance, he does show how and why he's so powerful, kind of for the first time that we really see, at least within the Empyrean here. He's twice the size of Solus, first of all, twice the size of him. And now we see for ourselves really and truly for the first time why he's so scary and why all the other dragons fear him. We know that this isn't the first incidence with Solus either since he took out his eye previously. So it's like, I wonder what the heck these two get up to in the veil. That's a good question. Like, do they just like stay on opposite ends of the veil? Like, this is my line. You do not cross it. it it's got to be, especially because Solus just returned with Varish from Samara and Taryn didn't even know that Solus was around. And as soon as he knew that Solus was around, he was immediately on the watch. So... <laughs> Um, did Varish respond to Taren? Taren is having his like protective dad times a million moment. And he says, I do not answer to you. Varish's next line is, but you, pointing to Violet, answer to me. Then Taren says, apologize. And Varish says, sorry. How would this work? Like, is it literally in distressed soulless translating for him, like back and forth? That was my impression. And again, we're going to bring in what we talked about at the top of this episode into this here as well, because there's that instance where we think that Varish might have responded to Taren then too about the barbaric lines. It was my impression that Solus was translating this. But gosh, you have a good point here. I also will say it's sounding like Rhiannon can hear it too because Taryn says something, I can't remember what it is, but something in anger and Re sucks in a breath. So is Taryn just speaking so loudly that he's projecting into every writer mind? However, to your point, Lex, earlier in this episode, we talked about him responding with the barbaric line. So something sus here and I don't know what it is. So in, in this instance, it's making me think that Taryn is that pissed off where he's like echoing into all the other writers. Think about the game of telephone, but he's shouting so loud that everyone can hear him anyway and there's no need for that middleman. Or, you know, it really might be the dragons communicating, which is how Varish did start his conversation with Taryn via Solus there. We know that. So once when the argument escalated, maybe that's when then Taryn voice was just echoing into everybody's heads. But I think that the basics is that it was just a dragon's translating, but I don't know. I don't know either, but I'm on the watch for this. I really, any mind-to-mind -mind speak even hint, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> 
Rhiannon and Violet. This was one of my most forgotten scenes that I yes. did not, I just did not remember it when I read it for the first time. But reading it again and again and again and again since, this might be one of my favorite moments between this duo in the entire two books that we have of the Empyrean series. Before we get into this like tragic moment for Violet, we hear Violet defend the gauntlet, which I'm not going to lie, was shocking. But then hearing her reasoning, I was like, okay, like I kind of get it. But you also can't help but think of formation in part two when Micah's name is called on the death roll and the Griffin Flyers absolutely fall apart and actually let themselves feel a goddamn emotion around death and how Violet almost envies it because she calls back to this moment in that scene in part two. I just thought that that was interesting hearing Violet defend the gauntlet, especially when she is in this, and I'll get into this in just a moment, when she is in this very rough state for her mental health and looking at things in a very pessimistic way especially like the gauntlet this scene I do think it is perfectly written like to a T no notes absolutely 10 out of 10 Violet's agony her anger and her finally hitting the breaking point you feel it with her in this moment with how it's written we've had moments here and there of highlighting Violet's PTSD on this podcast I want to pull this specifically from the National Institute of Health on their PTSD page. The most common symptoms of PTSD are being easily startled, vivid flashbacks and nightmares, being irritable or having angry outbursts, and engaging in risky behavior. All of these are things that our girl Violet experiences in this first stretch of the book. Now here's what really twists the knife for me in this moment is her saying how lonely she feels. It feels to me like a combination of everything for her in this big stretch of part one. Her searching the corners when she's walking to class, running in the morning, losing her mind anytime someone even slightly comes up behind her. This is all what she's going through and it's absolutely terrifying. And another L for our guy, Zayden. The fact that he is telling her to distance herself from her friends is such a massive thumbs down moment for him, thus making her feel even more lonely. Just because that's what he did and... Also, I'm going to point out, it does not mean it's healthy because I would argue that guy's got some therapy that he needs. I would argue that him keeping secrets to himself is not working for him on his end, just like it's not working for Violet and her own healing that she knows she needs to start doing. So just, I love this passage. Again, I think it's so overlooked, but it really feels like the amalgamation of her loneliness, her PTSD, her anxiety coming up to the forefront. It's very therapeutic. Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest critiques of Fourth Wing was how pointless all of these deaths seemed, that it was unrealistic and that there were a lot of questions around it. But we analyzed why Rebecca made this conscious decision to make the writer's quadrant essentially a death factory throughout our Fourth Wing deep dive, because as horrific as it seemed, there was a reason to it that we civilians couldn't possibly understand. And it culminates here in Violet's outburst. She understands because she's experienced why this is happening. So when you're first friend dies, you can keep fighting. Quote, we are the weapons and this place is a stone that they use to sharpen us. Ugh, it's just gut-wrenching, but it also, again, it makes sense in the bigger picture. Lexi, let's move on to foreshadowing in this stretch because there's a lot of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Terrence, despite what you may assume, I am not 600 years old, but and Darna kind of is. Just needed to throw yes, that out there. Violet would rather bring down a thousand lightning strikes than spend one night locked in a cage at Varish's mercy. Unfortunately, this will indeed be her nightmare come to life soon enough. Quote, there is no care for if I can aim, not a single consideration for mastery or strength. No, correct. Carr does not give a shit if you can aim, but Felix will absolutely give a shit and he will also take massive consideration for mastery and building up strength. Violet's long lightning strike. I call this out because as she masters her signet, as she builds this up, we see this move slightly again between her and the conduit, especially when Kat lights the torch. But you also can't help but think, is this going to be something we see from her in the future as she does master this signet? A long form lightning strike that she holds for a long time? I freaking hope so. The RSC water. Ugh, my nemesis. Violet will later recognize the smell when they go in for interrogation, thus saving them from making that stupid mistake Again, quote, Bade, Jack Barlow's dragon, or at least she was, unquote. Nope, she still is, because that guy is unfortunately still alive. When talking to Rhi at sparring challenges, quote, she helped me break into the fucking archives if I wanted. She is on the archives heist list, but unfortunately she cannot go due to Jacinia's people limit. The battle axe analogy. Oh boy, we will see this in a very intense scene in chapter 55. Zayden will take this analogy and 
quite literally run with it to the point of absolutely taking a dagger out of the closet and holding it to Violet's throat. We're going to debate the ethics of that, of how he took this analogy later on. I do not remember that part. (laughs) It happens. It was a lot. I don't know how I feel about it. It's not a good look for Zayden. Violet's inner monologue about the wards, quote, if the answer is in the archives, then it is well hidden. Yes, it is very well hidden. And the spot that it is in is in a place where the king would actually want to show it off. This says everything we need to know about this I dot of a king. When Zayden and Violet finally are able to see each other in Beskayeth, quote, I thought they were going to find a way to send you on maneuvers today or just lock you away. Then Violet says, I'm sure they'll find a dark cell for you next week. So we should try to enjoy this one. Not for Zayden, but boy, is this on the nose. When Zayden slides into her mind and asks, why aren't her her shields up, she says, quote, it's just us in here. Chapter 55 foreshadowing again when Zayn won't share anything in his very warded and soundproof room because, quote, there's always someone better at something than you are. Another line, quote, quote, I'm an incredible judge of character. That you are, Mr. Intrinsic Man. This whole bit has me cackling in a reread. Quote, so you can see if she, meaning Jasenia, if she's trustworthy by looking at her, even you aren't that powerful, unquote. Oh, yes, 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 Zayden is indeed that powerful. But that's the main reason he does need to go, to confirm if Jasenia has good intentions. She must pass the test before he can possibly let this go. And hey, she does pass the test. He says, thank you for helping us, automatically tying himself to the mission too, partly to protect Violet, but also because he knows that he can trust her. Can you imagine what he heard in Jasenia's head? <laughs> what I wouldn't give for that. Give me more Jasenia. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, man. Taryn says, quote, humans have the memories of gnats. Dragons hold the grudges. Yes, they do, Solus especially, for Taren and now for Violet, which we will see later in the cave. Lexi, let's now step into the archives where each episode, Lexi educates us all. We all sit in our little desk and Lexi's the teacher on a prominent world building topic from this stretch of chapters. What's today's archives topic, Lexi? Today, we are going to be talking all about your second year as a writer at Biscayeth War College. So hey, congratulations. You survived your first year in the writer's quadrant. You get some nice perks as second years, but <laughs> Don't expect life to get any easier. In the five days between graduation and conscription day, the second year's only duty is to prepare for the arrival of the first year's. Oh, and drink a lot, obviously. Right after the third year's graduate, you turn in your uniforms. You do keep your earned patches, of course, and then you pick up your new uniforms, which, of course, you'll be able to customize to your liking. As a second year, you stay with your squad from the previous year, although sometimes people do get moved around if, say, half a squad is torched by a one-eyed orange dragon. First years are added to your squad. As a reminder, the hardline rule is you cannot kill a squad mate. Second years can be squad leaders and the squad leaders choose their executive officers. We see this with Rian and she chooses Sawyer as her executive officer. Second years face harder courses. Now that second year cadets have bonded with dragons and learned the basics of flying, it's time to learn more complicated flight maneuvers, which include rolling dismounts and formation flights. The scariest new class and the staple of your second year is Rider Survival Course or RSC for short. It's classified, so no incoming cadet is even aware of it. It teaches you how to survive if you become separated from your dragon behind enemy lines. And in the classroom setting, you're taught navigation, survival techniques, oh, and how to withstand interrogation in case of capture. It culminates in two full evaluations you're required to pass in order to continue Epis in other words, to stay alive. One is within a few weeks of your first day, and the other is around mid-year. Exact dates are purposefully not given because you're supposed to be caught by surprise. And in between these evaluations, you'll face trials at any given time. Yes, that does indeed mean abduction. So during these trials, you're taking what you're taught in the classroom into a real life scenario. In the first abduction, cadets can ask questions and professors are specifically not present during the interrogation, but read the notes afterward and give their feedback. What are these trials? Land navigation, where you're paired with infantry squad, two healers and a scribe. We certainly saw that in this stretch of chapters. You're given two different maps, at least the first time around, to throw everybody off. 
off and it can last up to a few days if you fail, which most people do fail that first time. Another group is also in the vicinity and their dragons hunt you while your dragons hunt them. Plus a few unbonded dragons roam around too, just to make things extra exciting. Now the second trial is interrogation, which is grouped with your squad. Essentially, you just get the shit beat out of you and they try to break each squad member, attempting to turn each of you against one another. The goal is to learn how to withstand the hell you're put through and not die from the interrogation, which is absolutely possible. Which brings me to what happens if you don't pass, aka break during interrogation? You're killed. Simple as that. Oh, and you can also die from them just beating you so badly. So you could not even break and you still die just because, hey, it's Beskayeth. RSC is actually inspired by SERE, a real training program in the military. And it stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape, where they learn similar skills. But hey, you're not killed if you don't pass. Challenges, on the other hand, are essentially the same as they are in your first year. Second years can fight any other year, including first years on the mat. If you win the Iron Squad patch, which means your squad stayed the most intact, aka most of you survived, then you get to stay on the same mat during challenges. Nice little perk where everyone else has to rotate. Second years, they don't do the gauntlet, which as a reminder is to prove your physical strength to go through with presentation day. They also obviously do not participate in threshing. They're in the field as newly bonded first years come in, and we all know they can't intervene at threshing. Speaking of threshing, unbonded cadets from the previous year do not become second second years. They have to repeat their first year and hope to bond this time around. Only bonded writers can move on from first year into second year. <sighs> Let's move on to a lighter topic, like the perks you get as a second year. Second years don't have to do chores anymore the first thing in the morning since chores are exclusively for first years. This gives the second years the chance to sleep in an extra hour, which is fantastic unless you're part of the Biscayeth Running Club. Unlike first years, second years have weekends off. Hey! Second years are able to visit or sneak off to Chantal a nearby village that supplies Biscayeth. It's always been open to the other quadrants, but writers have been banned for the past decade after a fight led to a local bar burning down. There is a rumor that that's changed this year, so we're assuming they're not sneaking in and they're actually just visiting Shantara. Last thing on Shantara, technically the visits there are only for worship, but you know, writers are particularly excited to visit because it means opening up the dating pool because, hey, they're starting to get a little bit sick of each other. Go figure. Also, unlike first years, second years have letter writing privileges. Remember that you're not allowed to communicate with loved ones in your first year. So this is something second years really, really, really look forward to, to be able to connect again with their loved ones. A hard piece of advice for second years, however, don't get attached to any first year until after threshing because the likelihood is they'll die. First year is when some lose their lives. Second year is when the rest lose their humanity words from Zayden that are just oh so true. Statistically, a third of incoming second years won't survive to see their third year because Biscayeth, once again, is indeed a death factory sharpening these human weapons, as our girl Violet is all too aware of. All right, friends, quick note as we close out today's archives, if you want the Biscayeth War College archives discussion, please check out our Fourth Wing episode one. Wow, Nicole, that seemed like so long ago, episode one from Fourth Wing. That's when you and I were still splitting up archives and also battle briefs. We were doing them together. Together. Oh, how times have changed. Lexi, let's close out this episode with taking flight with our favorite moments, where we discuss our favorite moments, little bits and bobs from this stretch of chapters. You know, as much as I hate the situation Violet's in with the signet punishment, it's another instance of fantasy power just shining through the pages, and I always love it so much. We didn't get a ton of fantasy elements throughout Fourth Wing, mostly because Violet isn't bonded to a dragon and therefore not powerful in her own right for the first half. Iron Flame, though, is completely different and I just love it. There's real consequences for pushing your power and yourself to the limit. And the way that this plays out for Violet as a lightning wielder, I just think it's a great fantasy storytelling how like she's literally heating up from the inside. Her blood is boiling. Just all of this like again as gut-wrenching as it is what she's going through. I love the magic on page here. In that same scene there's a moment where Taryn lifts his wing to make the wind change so it starts cooling off Violet. It's just little moments like that where we're reminded how freaking considerate and sweet Taryn is at least physically, maybe not verbally. <laughs> Speaking of Taryn, we always need to pull out our favorite Taryn lines. Like when they get dropped off for the land navigation trial, he answers Violet, the course humans wouldn't have to take if they would simply stay seated, known as RSC. I love how he has double standards for Violet, who absolutely cannot keep her seat without the saddle. <laughs> love him. I love the descriptions for the uniform modifications. Violet has front slits for easy dagger access, aka her weapon of choice. Rhiannon has a tunic with sheaths sewn in. 
Sawyer likes his sleeves short and his weapons strapped to his upper arms. I like to think about when he goes into battle, he's like, <laughs> yes, like this. Like almost like cross his hands, grab the tops of his biceps and like grab his weapons. And of course, Riddick never took the time to see the uniform tailor, so he just ripped his sleeves off. This is everything you needed to know about our crew and more. I also love how when Violet and Imogen are watching Sloane on the mat, Violet tells Imogen to crouch and she immediately drops like no questions asked. Just trust. Shows the trust between those two. Speaking of Imogen, she thinks it's weird for Zayden to write Violet letters. He is such a ruthless killer. And then with Violet, he's writing his memoirs. And I just get such a kick out of imagining his friends seeing the super soft side of him. I could totally see Garrick Bodie and Imogen throwing him a super soft birthday party, which shouts to my letter candy friends who know that reference. Right over my head. <laughs> I figured it would. And then later when Imogen says to Violet, you're fucking clever. Way more clever than I gave you credit for. I bet you keep him constantly annoyed a smile beams across her face how glorious i love her so much there is no sign for wyvern and jesenia has to spell it out one more way of demonstrating how much the truth is erased from history and then when varus gestures towards taryn and violet thinks as if inviting me to ride my own dragon just one more little reason for us to hate this guy so much i just love that line jesenia's look at violet when she panic bursts into the archives quote her eyes flaring in an unspoken what the fuck as she approaches everyone knows this look i love it like, like, you know, you think about all the visuals that you have in your mind when you're reading, like that is one of the most clear ones because we all know that look. The little line about when Zayden drops his pack when he visits from Samara, like it's where they go. Like this room is partly his too. Like his room at Samara feels like it's mine. Neither of us have ever asked for separate quarters. It's just so cute. Oh, I love it. And then when Violet tells Zayden off when they meet Jasenia because he's scaring her and Zayden just goes, I'm just standing here. <laughs> Every moment in the Tarn and Varish and Solus retreat beg scene, Tarn is just the goat. And I can picture it so clearly of Varish like on his knees. I cannot wait for that scene in the TV show. And last but not least, quote, gods, I held onto him so tightly. This is when Violet is having her outburst in talking about Liam with Rhiannon. We normally talk about the funny moments and, you know, the Tarn lines that we love in these chapters, but this is a moment that is absolutely one of my favorites because of just how raw it is for Violet. And shouts to the narrator who does these this section perfectly, absolutely perfectly on the audiobook. This whole sequence felt so real and so raw. And it really is one of my favorite Violet moments in the book because yeah. she's finally letting it out and she's still not able to say exactly what she needs to. But oh my gosh, she's finally connecting with her friend and not distancing herself. But she's also taking Zayden's advice and not, well, She's about to say something and then Varish comes up. We'll talk a little bit later about Violet and how bad she is at keeping secrets because I am still going to slightly defend her because that's what I'm doing in this book pretty much. <laughs> But we'll get to that next episode. Friends, that is all we've got for you today. Next episode, we will be covering chapters 20 through 27. I can't believe how fast we're going through this book, although it's going to seriously slow down as we start getting to the bigger parts. <laughs> I will say we're covering chapter 27, which is the shower scene next week, and <laughs> I cannot wait. I'm so excited. <gasps> Thank you to our executive producer, Hayden, who is also our sanity manager. We love you. And like we said at the top of the episode, if you are interested in supporting us more, if you want more content, if you just love fantasy fangirls, please join the Patreon party and you can find the link in our show notes. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok if you are not already at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Also, do not forget to rate and review the show. The success of the show very quickly has been such a huge testament to you all taking the time to submit your reviews, to rate on whatever platform you're listening on. And hey, if you're on YouTube, which we know a lot of you are, please take a moment to like and subscribe to the show. And last but not least, and this is probably most important of all, share this with your fellow Iron Flame friends. You know the people who are just taking forever to finish the last few chapters because they don't want the book to end. Send this podcast to them as a, hey, this is your book hangover cure. So don't worry, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And then watch them just absolutely get destroyed by chapter 66. You're welcome. Wow. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> we love you all. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And now, friends. 
Please enjoy some bloopers. The next day, the failure... Bleh. The next... <laughs> These two have a totally surface level, not at all treason. It could be considered murdered for this conversation. Conversation. What did I just say? <laughs> Just before battle brief, bleh, just before battle beef, beef. <laughs> Shouldn't give, so I did not finish my sentence. There are a family. I also did not finish my sentence there. Are we okay? <laughs> when we wrote this so. outline. At the end of this book series, at the end of this book series, bleh, at the end of this book series, I can speak. You know, Violet's got her own books, books, you know, Violet's got her own books, <laughs> subscription. <laughs> Violet's got her own books, subscription. <laughs> It doesn't add once. <laughs> you want to finish that sentence? I don't know if I do. <laughs> <laughs> Rhiannon has a tunic with see with seeds seeds sheaths sheaths. sheaths. <laughs> Rhiannon has a tunic with sheaths sewn. It <laughs> Jesus Christ! You can find the link to the you can find the link to in our you can find the link in our show notes or hey it's all over our and you can find the link in our show notes. <laughs>